We are moving on. Holy Habits is the name of the new series. That's where we're going. The name of the new series is Holy Habits, and this is a series about spiritual disciplines, which are uh, simply practices or habits uh, that help us to encounter God. So that's, that's what we're going to be diving into for the next several weeks, is just these, these habits, these practices that, that really help us to encounter a holy God. And so, so let me just say this up front, all right? Um, habits don't make you holy. So I know that name may be a little confusing, so I just want to clarify right up front. The habits themselves do not make us holy. So it's not like as we walk through this series and we, we dive into these spiritual disciplines that, that doing them is somehow going to make you holier than people who don't do them, all right? Habits don't make us holy, but they can draw us near to a holy God. And so that's why we're calling this holy habits, because we want you to be able to draw near to a holy God. And in the process of drawing near to God, he refines us. God makes you holy. Let me, let me be clear about that. Habits don't ever make you holy. God makes you holy. But it is through these habits, through these practices, through these disciplines that we press into that we draw near to God. We spend time in his presence. We connect with him. We hear him. We listen to him. We obey him. And in that process, he refines us and transforms us and molds us into his image. And that is what makes us holy. Amen? We all on the same page? Great. All right. So here's a quick definition of the word habit, just so, so you, you understand where we're going, why we're talking about holy habits. Uh, so the, the dictionary definition is, it is a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. So, so it's a, a settled, regular tendency or practice that is especially hard to give up. And I think when we tend to think about spiritual disciplines, and I understand maybe some of you here in this room, that term doesn't even mean anything to you. But if you've been around the church for a while and you're familiar with that language, we don't tend to think of spiritual disciplines as something that's hard to give up. We tend to think of it as something that's hard to, to get into, something that's hard to start, something that's to, hard to stick with. But, but my desire for us is that these disciplines would become so normal so natural for us, so much a part of our, our rhythm and our routine that, that it's more difficult for us not to do them than it is for us to do them. So here are just some examples of some common habits. Maybe some of you can relate with these and, and uh, we'll see, see how honest you are here. How many of you would be honest and say you have the habit of biting your nails? Any nail biters in the room? Yes, yeah, some nail biters. They're like, don't look at my nails. You know, they're, yeah, okay. So we got a few nail biters in the room. Uh, that is a habit that you, you probably just feel like at this point, it's, it's just so commonplace, so normal to you. You don't even notice that you're doing it. Uh, how about this one? How many of you would say you are avid coffee drinkers? It is a habit for you. Yes, yes, all the coffee drinkers. Uh, <laughs> we got some people who own a coffee shop sitting right in the front row. So, so yeah, I, I would imagine they are avid coffee drinkers. And, and how many of you have a rule, do not talk to me before I have had at least one cup of coffee in the morning. Anybody being willing to be honest about that one? Okay, a few of you, a few of you. Uh, here's another, another habit uh, that, that many people struggle with. Um, hitting the snooze button. How many of you would be honest and admit that you would, I, I, I saw my wife's hand, and, uh, and that is a habit that she has of hitting the snooze button. I am anti-snooze. I'm against it. I've done the research. It's bad for you. Just set the alarm for the time that you know you're going to get up, all right? If you don't know, this is a point of tension. So I, 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 learned, I learned my lesson, and I realized uh, I just got to get up before her first alarm goes off, and then I'm fine, right? That's why I get up at 5 in the morning every day. I don't have to have that battle anymore. Uh, that took probably 10 years of marriage to figure that one out. Um, how many of you have the habit of cracking your knuckles? Any knuckle crackers in the room? Yes, yes. How many of you can't stand when somebody cracks their knuckles? All right, yes. Anybody, anybody married to a uh, person who cracks their knuckles and you can't stand it? <laughs> Sarah Hooley in the back <laughs> on staff. That's great. That's good. That is great. Um, chewing with your mouth open. Anybody willing to admit that's a habit you have, chewing with your mouth open? All right. How many of you cannot stand to eat with somebody who chews with their mouth open? Listen. I have a lot of lunches with people. Do not invite me to lunch with you. 
If you're going to chew with your mouth open, all right, we'll go get coffee because that's another habit I have, and that's fine, all right, but do not invite me if that's your, your habit. All right, how about this one? Uh, how many of you have a bad habit of checking your phone, checking your phone, just willing to admit? All right, how many of you have already checked your phone since the service started? Raise your hand. How many? Okay, yes. You've opened an app. You've, you've checked, checked Instagram, checked Facebook, checked Twitter, whatever it may be. Yes, that is a bad habit that many of us struggle with. So, so clearly, we've all developed these habits, right? We've all developed these habits in our lives that become so routine for us that we don't even notice it. We just do it, right? It's just, just so commonplace for us, so ordinary, so normal for us that it's, it's, it's just a natural part of who we are. It's second nature. That is my desire for us as we walk through this series, that by the time we're done, the habits that we've discussed, the habits that we've, we've really taken a deep dive into will be so commonplace for us, so normal for us, as followers of Jesus, that, that we won't even have to think about it. It won't be something that we feel like, oh man, we, I, I, I gotta make sure I start that. I gotta really try, try to do that. No, it'll be like, no, I just, it, it's hard for me to give it up. Spending time in the Word, that's hard for me to give it up, right? Pr- praying, that's hard for me to give it up. Whatever it is, that, that by the time we're done with the series, so, so our goal in this series is not just to teach you. It is, my, my desire is that this would be the most practical series we could ever walk through as a church, that you would put these into practice, and eventually they would just be, this is who you are. And can, can you imagine, just, just for a second, think about it, can you imagine what your life would look like if you really pressed into the spiritual disciplines, so much so that they were so part of who you are, so central to who you are, that like you couldn't go a day without missing it? Like, like, it would be like, it would be like waking up in the morning without a cup of coffee. Like, it would, just something would feel off. Can you imagine what would happen? Can you imagine the kind of person you would become? Can you imagine the, the, the intimacy that you would have with God? And isn't that what we all want, ultimately? Isn't that what we all want, just a deep, intimate relationship with the creator of the universe? Can you imagine that? And then can you imagine the impact it would have on not only your life and your relationship with God, but then your relationship with other people? Can you imagine how, how it would influence your marriage or, or your dating relationship? How it would influence your coworkers, the, the people that you spend time with, or, or your kids, and, and, and then on down the line to generation after generation after generation? And, and here's the beautiful thing. There is no better time to start than now. There is no better time to start than now. And so today, um, we are going to start with the the habit or the practice, the discipline of studying Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's where we're going to begin. We're looking at two passages of Scripture today. And um, really, what I want to do is is ask the question and help answer the question, what does the Bible say about itself? So we're starting with studying Scripture because I believe this is foundational for all the other habits that we're going to talk about. We have to have a foundation. We have to have something that is, is an authority for us. And so, so many of you, maybe you've never read the Bible before. You've never had a practice of reading the Bible before. You're not really sure, why should I read the Bible? Or, or what's the point of the Bible? Or what even is the Bible? What does it have to say about itself? And so we're going to ask that question and answer that question through a couple of texts today. Sex, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 14. This is the Apostle Paul Uh, writing to Timothy, and he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness." so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So so let me just start with this. This book is not just any book. The Bible is not just any book. It's not just another book. It's it's not even just an inspiring book. It is the inspired word of God. It is God-breathed. So the God of the universe, the creator of the universe who created everything we know and don't know and sustains everything we know and don't know, that same God who is transcendent above and over everything is also so intimately connected to us and desires to have such an intimate relationship with us that he has actually communicated 
who he is, his heart, his desires, his plan, his purpose, his nature, his character in his word. He has revealed himself to us through his word. And this is what the Bible tells us. It is God breathed. And so, yes, Scripture was, if you're curious, you're wondering, wondering what, like, how did this come about? Yes, it was penned by man, so God inspired human authors to write this. So the Apostle Paul did write this text that we're reading, but it's different than if I were to write you a letter. Even if, even if I felt like the Holy Spirit had impressed on my heart to write you and communicate something to you, that is different than this. What I would write to you would not be Scripture. What is written here is Scripture in that it is God breathed. It is inspired by God. So much so that it is inerrant, infallible, authoritative, trustworthy, and true. And, and so, so therefore, that's why we start with the foundation of the Word of God. And just think about that for a second. That, that the God of the universe wants you to know him and he wants to know you so much so that he would reveal himself to you through his word and that you have access to it any time you want, that it is available to you. And so I just, just want to point out a few things from this text before we move on to the next one. The first one is uh, in verse 14 where Paul says, as, as for you, continue in what you have learned and, and become convinced of because you know those from who you learned it. This is so important for us. If, if we want others to be convinced that this book is life-changing, then it should change our lives too. Right? Like, like if, if I want to convince somebody else that, that Jesus can change their life, then when they see my life, they should be able to say like, yes, without Christ, you would be like this, but because of Christ, you are changed, transformed. And let me be clear, following Jesus doesn't make you better than anyone else. Following Jesus doesn't make me better than you. Following Jesus makes me better than me. And following Jesus makes you better than you. Are, you, are we tracking? Are we on the same page? Are you following here? It's not about being better than anyone. It's, be, it's about being better than who I would be without Christ. And so, so Paul starts with like, look at the example of those who taught you. Like it's clear, it's evident in their lives. They're living this out. They're not just preaching the Bible, they're living it out. And then from there, he says, and from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are, pay attention to this, this is so important, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So, so listen. The Bible, primarily, first and foremost, is a book about God. And what we have done and what I have seen done throughout my lifetime in the church is that we have made this book a book that is primarily about me. And when we make this book primarily about us, rather than primarily about God, we miss it. Now listen, I'm going to get to this. The Bible is also about you, but you're not the point. The point of the Bible is Jesus. From, from beginning to end, from, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible is pointing to Jesus. The Old Testament is continually looking forward and pointing to a Messiah, a Savior, Jesus. And the New Testament is continually pointing back to the Messiah, the Savior, the resurrected King, Jesus, and ultimately concludes with the return of that King, Jesus. From cover to cover, the Bible is about Jesus, not you, not me. We have a part to play, we have a role to play, but the Bible is ultimately about Jesus. And our source of salvation and our ability to even understand salvation comes through the word of God because God has revealed himself to us. He has revealed himself ultimately in Christ. You wanna know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And then he has also revealed himself through his word. And so the, the, the word says about itself that the holy scriptures give us wisdom to be able to experience salvation through what? Faith in Jesus. So the primary point of the Bible is for you to put your faith in Jesus. That's what it's all about. It, the, the, from beginning to end, it is trying to help you and, and teach you and enable you to put your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus. And so, so before I move on, let me just say, if you have not done that yet, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, if you would not say, I have crossed that line and, and I have chosen to follow Jesus, there is no better day than today to do that. And you can do that here. 
Before you leave today, you can do that. We will have a team of people up front who would love to pray with you and, and we would lead you and guide you through that process. Simple process of just surrendering your life. Simple, not easy, but simple process of surrendering your life to Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. Verse 16 He says, all scripture, pay attention to that, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So again, it's it's God-breathed, it's inspired, it's inerrant, it's trustworthy. Listen, you can trust the word of God. You can't trust everybody else all the time. You just can't. You won't always be able to trust everybody else. You won't always be able to trust me. I don't get it right 100% of the time. This is why I always say, read the Bible. Like, spend time in the Word. Even take, take what I'm teaching and preaching and, like, test it through the Scriptures itself. There are going to be times where I get it wrong. But the Bible is trustworthy. God is always trustworthy. So you can trust Him. And then from there, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I, I think that we really love the first part of that, we kind of like the last part of that, and we kind of hate the second and third part of that. We, we love the teaching, right? We just, we just live in a culture that loves to eat up as much teaching as we can. I mean, how many of you are just big podcast people? Any podcast people just love listening to podcasts, can't get enough podcasts? Can I just say something about that? Like, the, like nine of the top 10 podcasts are all about murder and crime. What does that say about us? It, it tells you that you are a depraved human being and you need Jesus. I don't even know where I was going though. Teaching. Yeah, we love, we love information. We love being taught. When it comes to being rebuked, that's something that we don't really care for. And I think there are a lot of people who don't read the Bible because they don't want it to rebuke them. So, so rebuking is like you're, you're, you're in sin. And the truth is we're all sinners. And so when we walk through the word of God and we spend time in the word, it will rebuke us. God will, through the power of his Holy Spirit, rebuke us when we spend time in the word. And so we've got to to learn to get okay with that and to be comfortable with that. It's not going to be easy. But also to understand that God, when he rebukes you, he does it as a loving father. Loving father. And so so he's not going to beat you up, but he he is going to call you out on your sin. And then correcting is, is more along the lines of, of, you know, like when you're getting it mostly right, but you're just maybe, you're turning in a different direction. You, you're, you're starting to lean a little bit left, a little bit right. And I'm not talking politics right there. I'm just saying whatever direction you're going, God will come alongside and correct you. Anybody here ever taught a kid how to uh, ride a bike? Anybody ever done that before? Taught a kid how to ride? Okay, yeah. So um, when you teach a kid how to ride a bike, you, you kind of come alongside them. And then, and then you just kind of guide them. And then when they start to lean just a little bit left, you just kind of give just a little bit of correction. You don't overcorrect, just a little bit of correction. They lean a little bit right, give a little bit of correction to the point that they can really do it on their own. I taught my daughter how to ride a bike, and that's how you do it until she can do it on her own. And so God, sometimes he will just come alongside us, and, and there will be those times where we're reading Scripture, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, how did I miss that? Like, uh, uh, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm moving in the right direction for the most part, but here's an area where I missed it, and so God will correct us. And then finally, training in righteousness. Did you know that like you're in training? If you are a follower of Jesus, you are perpetually in training. You are in a state of spiritual training. He is training you just like a coach would. And he's training you for a reason. What does the text say? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. One of my favorite things about following Jesus is that following him does not finish with salvation. And I think this is an area where the church has missed it for a long time. We draw the finish line at salvation. We're so concerned with getting people saved. Yes, I want to get as many people as possible saved, but that's not the finish line. That's the starting line. You are saved so that then you can go and serve, so that you can go and do the good works that God has has been training you and preparing you and equipping you to do. Isn't that amazing that the God of the universe not only wants to save you, but wants to use you to advance his kingdom? Every single one of you, not just pastors, not just leaders, not just just preachers, teachers. Every single one of us, if you are in Christ, he has a plan for you. He has good works for you to do. And he will equip you primarily through the study of his word to do it. And so if you find yourself frustrated and feeling like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. God, you, you haven't really given me anything to do. Let me ask you. 
have you been faithful to your training? Have you been faithful to the training program? Because he, he cannot, as a good father, he cannot send you out ill-equipped. Otherwise, you will fail. So, so spend time in the word. Let's look at one more text. Hebrews 4, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews 4. You guys still out there? Still awake? Still alive? All right. Hebrews 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, so yes, the word of God it is inspired. It is God breathed. And that means it, he has chosen to communicate himself to you. But not only does he communicate himself to you, he, he, he also communicates who you are. When you spend time in the word, he communicates who you are to him. He, he reveals things that you didn't even know about yourself. Areas, areas of sin or judgment or anger, the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. He, he, will, he will divide that and show you and reveal that. He will lay that Bear. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him who must give an account. It's a living and active word. It's a powerful text. It is living and breathing still to this day. And so I just, I just want to encourage you, like this is not just an old ancient document. I think there are a lot of people, even, even in the church, even who would say they are Bible-believing, right? I'm a Bible-believing Christian. But then when, they, when it comes to reading the Bible, they just approach it from this, this purpose of like information. I just got to get more information, right? And so they go to this end of the spectrum where it's like just all about information, consuming as much as I, I possibly can. And so I, I read the Bible. I read the Bible every day and I read six chapters a day. And that way I can get through the Bible, you know, at least once a year, maybe twice a year. And it's all about information, information, information. But, but they fail to recognize, no, it's, it's a living breathing book. It's living and active, still speaking today. So it's not just an old ancient text, but on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of Christians, a lot of Bible-believing Christians, who when it comes to the Word of God, they treat it more like just this, this magical, mystical, spiritual book that kind of dropped out of heaven, you know, fell out of the sky, and is full of just these spiritual nuggets of wisdom, right? And so have you ever met somebody who does like that when they read the Bible, it's just kind of one of these bad boys, right? Open it up, and they're like, all right, the descendants of Machir, son of Manasseh, went to Gilead, captured it, and drove down to the Amorites who were there. All right, God's word for me today is capture. I got to go capture somebody. That's a spiritual nugget word for me today. How many of us do that when it comes to the word of God? Have you ever read any other book that way? Ever? Any other book that way? Yet we treat the word of God like that. So it's not just some sort of mystical, magical book full of spiritual nuggets and, and wisdom. But it's also not just some ancient dead text. It is living and active. And so, so hear me, going to either one of those extremes is dangerous. But when you, when you hold the tension, right? That yes, it, it is an ancient text. We should acknowledge that. It is an ancient text. It is a historical document. But it's also more than that. So we need to understand the context. We need to understand what we're reading, what was going on in the world at that time. What, you know, who is this about Rather than just, again, assuming that it's always about us, stop inserting ourselves into the scripture and just ask, like, what is actually happening in this text? Who was it written for? Who was it written to? But then from there, take it and say, okay, and, and then because it's a living, breathing, alive and active, inspired by God text, it's still speaking today. So, so how, does that, how does that event that, that information that I read about that happened then, how does that now apply? What, what, what do I learn from this? Sometimes it's just information we need to know. But more importantly, it, it should be information and inspiration that then leads to transformation. That's what we need when it comes to studying the word of God. We, we need to, yes, we need information. We also need to be inspired so that we can be transformed. So, so listen to me. God loves you. He does. He, like, he created you. He made you. And, and, and you're the only you 
that, that he's ever going to make. And he designed you specifically the way that you are. And he wants to know you and he wants to be in relationship with you. And so much so that he has given us his word. He has given you this word and he has said, please, th this is for you to know him and for him to know you. And so this, this is why when, when, if you've been a student of the Bible for a long time, this is why when you read the same thing, you could read the same text maybe a hundred different times. And every time God will continue to speak to you in that text, sometimes in new ways, sometimes just in deeper ways, but he will continue to speak to you because he wants to encounter you in that moment. When you're reading the Bible, it's not just you in the Bible. Do you know that? Like if you are a follower of Jesus, when you are reading the Bible, it is you and the Holy Spirit together. And he is illuminating the text and he is bringing things to your heart and to your mind and revealing his truth to you. So yes, God, God loves you and he wants to know you and he wants you to know him. And reading the Bible is one of the best possible ways you can do that. Now, now I know that there are some people here who would be in 100% agreement with me, but you would just simply say, I just don't, I don't know how, like I don't know where to begin. It's just, it's, it's difficult, it's confusing at times, it, it's a complex book. And, and, and let me agree with you there, it can be a complex book. It can be. And there's a lot there. And so what I want to do with the remainder of our time today is just give you a, a simple tool. It's not perfect, it's not flawless, but it's a simple tool that I have used, that I have taught uh, when I was a student pastor. I taught students to use this for many years. I have used it myself, and I don't care how long you've been studying the Bible. If you use this tool, it will be helpful for you. And so I, I just want to walk through this, this tool with you for the remainder of the time. It's a little cheesy. It's an acronym. I, I, I know it's cheesy, but uh, I've already had some pretty bad pastor's jokes today, so I'm just going to keep rolling with the cheesiness here. Uh, it is the acronym SOAP, S-O-A-P. So everybody say SOAP. 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 All right. S-O-A-P. And so we're going to walk through each one of those quickly here. Uh, the first one is if you want to know how to read the Bible, and you want to get better at reading the Bible, then you have to start with reading the Bible. Scripture is the first one. Just start there. So, so I've had this conversation with so many people that are like, I just, I just don't know how to read the Bible, or I just, I, I just struggle to read the Bible, and so I just don't read the Bible. And, and the best advice I can give you is if you want to get better at reading the Bible, you have to read the Bible. You just have to. How many of you are familiar with the rule? It's called the 10,000 hours rule. Anybody ever heard of this rule before? Okay, so Malcolm Gladwell kind of made it famous with that book, Outliers, but uh, he was not the first person to come up with this concept. But essentially what the 10,000 hours rule says is that in order to become a master of something, to, to master a specific discipline or skill, you have to spend 10,000 hours of dedicated, intentional, focused practice at whatever that is. That, that, that's essentially the rule. So if you want to get incredibly gifted and to the point where you can say you've mastered something, it, it takes time. So earlier today, when we were worshiping, uh, Brant was up here playing this electric guitar. How many of you just at some point noticed Brant just shredding on that electric guitar? Anybody else notice that? I was just, I was just watching Brant, and I'm like, man, I just love the way he plays guitar. Now listen, some of you know this. I also play guitar. But then when I watch Brant play guitar, I'm like, oh yeah, no, I don't really play, I don't really play guitar. <laughs> I know I strum a few chords, but, but when I watch, and he makes it look so easy, doesn't he? Like he's just, like he started that, that second song and he's just, just, just making it look like he's just flowing, just flowing. There you are, Brant. He's just flowing over there. And, and I'm watching him, and I'm, but because I've played guitar enough, I know how hard that is. And I think for a lot of us, when we watch somebody like Brant, we tend to just put him in that category of like, oh, yeah, he's just naturally gifted. Yeah, like he's just, he's just musically inclined, right? Like that's just, that's just natural for him. And so, you know, it just comes easy for him. I could never do that because, you know, I just don't have that skill set. But when we do that, we're actually doing him a disservice because we're not acknowledging the hours and hours and weeks and months and years of practice that he has been putting into this. Brant, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but just how many years have you been playing guitar? About 18. 18 years. So in 12, 12 more years, if you play an hour a week, Brant, you will have mastered this, all right? So just, just so you know, that's about how, how that works. 18 years to get to that level, to be that skillful. So, so, so hear me, if, if you want to get to the point where you really feel like, man, I, I, not, not that you're ever going to, let me be clear, you will never master the Bible. 
it will always master you. God will always master you. But if you want to get to the point where you feel like, man, I'm starting to get an understanding of this, like I, I feel more natural at it, like it, it's just starting to make more sense to me, it's going to start with time. And an hour a week, or an hour a day, an hour a day, 365 days a year, is about 27 years to get to that 10,000 hour mark. I've, I've been studying the Bible about at that pace for about half of that amount of time. And, and I will tell you this, I don't feel anywhere close to mastering it. And I've talked to people who have studied the Bible for 50, 60, 70 years. And the conversations I have with them is, is that they feel like they know even less now, not because they, they've learned less, but because they, they just start to get a bigger picture of just how incredible and how powerful and how alive and active and inspired this text is. You will never run out of content. You will never get bored. It, it will, you, you will never reach the, the finish line where you can say, yep, I did it. I know everything there is to know about the Bible. It will not happen for you. And so I want to encourage you to spend time reading the Bible. I've got a good friend here. His name's Ty Bruce. And Rona is on staff. You saw her in the announcements video today. And her husband, Ty, he's, he's, a, he's a firefighter and he's just a beast, which I feel like that's just the rule. If you're going to be a firefighter, he's going to be a beast at everything. And so Ty is in his mid-40s. And he was coming to my workout group for a little while. And, and I like to pride myself in how difficult this workout group is. And then Ty stopped coming because it wasn't hard enough for him. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I got more important things to do. And he's, he's got a good, you know, 10, 12 years on me. And so Ty, um, Ty is an avid mountain biker. And so uh, he'll go ride Franke Park and, and just spend hours out at Franke Park riding those mountain bike trails. And that's something that I like to do. I just don't do it that often. And so I texted Ty a couple of months ago, and I said, I haven't been on the trails all summer. Would you go out there with me, and we'd just go ride together? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So I throw my bike in the back of my vehicle, and like a normal person, I drive over there and unload it, and then here comes Ty. He rode his bike to the trails so that he could ride the trails, so then afterwards he could ride his bike back home. So, so I'm like, oh, all right. This is how that's going to go. So, uh, so we get out of the trails. It had been a while since I've ridden the trails, and, and Ty is just smoking me. Like, I cannot hang with this dude. And I'm like, yeah, there's just, there's, uh, it, just the fitness level. I'm like, Ty, you're in a totally different, different level, different ballpark than me. And he goes, no, Chris, he goes, to be honest with you, I just, I just do this a lot. He said, the more time you spend out here, like the easier it will be for you. And I, now listen, I know that Ty was just being nice and humble <laughs> in that moment. <laughs> but, but then he, he did say something that is really true. He, he said, the more time you're out here, the more you learn the trails. So you actually start to know, like you know what's coming up ahead, you know when you're going to need to pedal harder, you know when you're going to need to break, you know when you're going to need to turn, you know when the jumps are coming for me so I can avoid them for Ty so he can fly over them. <laughs> but but he's, he's right. The more time you spend on the trail, the more you, you learn the trail. And I, I want to tell you, the more time you spend on this word, the, the more you're, gonna, you're just going to start, it's going to feel natural. And, and the more you, you, will, you will start to know your father the more you'll start to hear the Holy Spirit's voice. And, and, and it will, it's, it's never going to be perfect, but I'm, I'm telling you, it will just start to feel more natural. But you have to start with Scripture. Start with Scripture. So I want to challenge you. Commit to a daily practice of reading the Bible throughout this series. Throughout the series, if you're not doing it, start today. Don't start tomorrow. Start today. Pick a time, set that time, and commit to it that you are going to spend time. It doesn't have to be an hour. Listen, I know that can seem overwhelming. But pick a time, and maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 15 minutes, but that you're going to spend throughout this series a daily practice of reading your Bible. Uh, the second one is O, observation. So this is where we move from just reading it to comprehending it. So what's going on here? Asking those observation questions. What did the passage say? I mean, that's just basic, you know, like, like second grade reading level stuff. How many teachers do we have? Do we have any teachers in the room here today? Can we just say thank you for the teachers here for just a second for, for all that they're doing this year, serving our community? But if you're a teacher, especially an elementary school teacher, you know this is, this is kind of the process to teach somebody how to read. First, it's just read the words. Next, it's comprehend what is it saying. So ask those questions. And this is where you need to come up with a list of questions, and we're going to give you a resource when you leave here that will help you with that. But just ask, what does the passage say? And again, start with God, not me. What does this passage have to say about God? What does this text have to say about God? What does this book have to say about God? 
What does it say about his nature, about his character, about his heart? He is the point of the story, not you. So what does it say about God? What's going on in the text? What's being communicated in the text? What's the main idea behind this text? Who wrote it? Why were they writing? Who were they writing to? And there are resources that you can dive into if you want to take a deeper dive. And and, and I'm going to talk about that at the very end of our message. But just begin to ask these questions to observe what is going on in the passage. The third one is application. So again, I, I have pressed this pretty hard. The Bible is not primarily about you. It is about God. It is about Jesus. But, but you have a part to play. And God wants you to be a part of this story. And, and so this is where you begin to ask the question, how does this passage apply to your life? Like, how how does this apply to your life? How can you live out? Maybe it's the the main point or the main truth from this text. How how can you live that out this week or or this day? Or or, or just how does it apply to your life? What is this passage teaching you? Remember, it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So, So what is this passage teaching you? Sometimes it's just a truth that you need to know about God. How is it rebuking you? Maybe maybe you're just being convicted of some sin in your life. Listen, every time I read the Bible, every time I, I spend some time in the Word, I get convicted on some level of something. So, so it, that is normal and that is natural. It, 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 is, it should be normal for us to be comfortable being rebuked by God because he loves us. Yes, he's going to teach us, he's going to correct us, but there are times where he is also going to rebuke us. Where is this passage correcting you? Where is the text correcting you? What is this training you to do? Maybe you, you find yourself walking through a book, walking through a text, walking through a certain study, and then you start to realize because the Holy Spirit starts to illuminate, open up your eyes, and you realize, man, like this, this applies so much to what I'm dealing with in my life. Anybody here ever experienced that before? Like you spent time in the Word, and then all of a sudden, like that same day or that same week, you start walking through something, and you're like, yeah, that's right. You know, that wasn't an accident, right? You understand that, don't you? Like that was God. He was meeting you there. He was preparing you for that. And so just ask the question, what are you going to do about it? application, application. I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, truth is a lot like paint in that its greatest value is in its application. So anybody have buckets of paint laying around in your basement or somewhere in your house, in your garage or whatever? Anybody have buckets of paint that you bought and you never opened and they're still laying around just willing to be honest about that? All right. It's not doing you a whole lot of good in that bucket, is it? It's there. It's not doing you a whole lot of good. The same thing is is true when it comes to the Bible. Like, yes, it's good for us to know this, but not if we're we're not going to apply it. So so begin to apply these truths to your life. Live them out. Ask him, like, what what am I supposed to do about this? And then be obedient. And then finally, the last part is prayer. Prayer. Now, I, I would tell you this. I believe that you should begin with prayer and end with prayer. Like when you spend time in the word, you should start just just by inviting God into that process and and just acknowledging, yes, you you are not doing this alone. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a special prayer. You don't have to have to say any any sort of theological words. Just be honest and real. To be honest with you, Jesus actually kind of condemns all that extra stuff. He just wants you to be real and transparent with him. So in your own words, just invite him in. You're going to read, read some of the scripture, and so, so just go before him. And, and, and I would encourage you even specifically to, to address the Holy Spirit as such. You have the Holy Spirit with you. And so to call him by name and just say, Holy Spirit, I, I just invite you in. As I am spending time in your word, I'm inviting you in. So please, show me what you want me to see. Open my eyes to see what you want me to see. Open my ears to hear what you want me to hear. Open my heart to receive what you want me to receive. And open my hands and and, and my feet to to respond in the way that you want me to respond. I I need you. I need you. I I don't know exactly what I'm reading. I don't understand everything I'm reading, but I believe that you are with me and that you can reveal your truth to me. Just invite him in. However you want to pray, invite him into that process. Invite him in. I would also encourage you as you're walking through scripture, sometimes one of the most powerful things you can do is actually pray through the passage. Just pray through it. As you're reading it, maybe after you've read it, just go back through and just pray through that passage. Pray for God's wisdom. Pray for his courage. Pray for his conviction in your life. And then finally, thank him for meeting you in that moment 
thank him for revealing his truth to you through his word and just have a heart of gratitude that you have encountered a holy God who is refining and transforming your heart and your life. And so listen, when you leave today, we're going to give you a tool and, and it's, it's this exact tool that I just walked through. And, and so it's just a little handout. If you're online, we're going to post this on our social media today after the service. So you will see it on our Facebook and, and on our Instagram account. So you can grab it there. Uh, but if you're in the house, we're going to give you this tool when you walk out of the room today. And, and, and it's a, a walk through, a week-long walk through of the book of Philippians. And so I want to encourage you, if you are not in a regular habit Regular practice of studying the word, start today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start today. There's no better time than today. And, and, it, and it walks through these exact same questions that I just gave you, scripture, ob- observation, application, and prayer. And this is a great resource for you. Uh, Sarah Hooley developed this resource. And also, I want to invite you, uh, later on this week, we're going to upload a, a midweek video. We're going to do that throughout this series where Sarah is going to go and take a little deeper dive into what we've talked about. And so uh, check back later on, maybe uh, by Wednesday afternoon or evening, it should be up. But, uh, but you can actually learn more. You can get more resources. We want to equip you. We want to equip you in this series. I, I don't want to just teach you. I want us to live this. I want to see what it, what it can do for us as we encounter a holy God. So, so let me pray for you, and then a couple more things, and we'll get you out. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for, for meeting us here today. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us, that you have given us your word, that it is trustworthy and true, and that you encounter us in it that you, you meet us there, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have done that here today, and we just ask you to continue to do that every single day as we commit to these practices so much so that they just become habits that, that are difficult to give up. And God, we pray that as we do that, um, we would not rely on the habit or the practice, but we would rely on you and that in, in our encounter with you, you would refine us and transform us and conform us to your image, thus making us holy. Have your way in this church body. Help us to lean on you in this season. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen.